Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar uh, for a course that we will be running next month and, and I'll give you the dates and, and details later on. Um, since it's still early January, uh, happy new year and all the very best for 2022. Hopefully we've kept all the bad stuff behind in 2021. Um, so, my name is, uh, well, the, the whole name is there, but uh, my name is Murli. Uh, I'm a senior program manager at ARTC, and uh, this course is being run uh, under ARTC's auspices. Uh, ARTC uh, last year was uh, certified by SSG as a CET, which is for continuing education and training. Uh, and this is one of the courses we offer. So the way we're going to run this today is that I'm just going to give you a brief introduction and to ARTC and what the, what we do. Uh, then uh, two of our uh, associates uh, from Two Rhineland, Ian, Ian McDonnell, uh, who's the training manager, and I'll let him introduce himself when he goes into it. Uh, and maybe the easiest way to do this is to just show you the agenda. Uh, he will talk about risk management in electric vehicles. And then um, the CEO and production lead of Scorpio Electric, which is a local homegrown company producing electric, in the process of producing electric vehicles. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Taureza, who's also a CEO, will talk about the, the practical aspects because they are in the process of actually putting together a vehicle. Uh, we'll uh, have about 10, 15 minutes of q and It might extend a little bit if there are enough questions. And the aim is to end at 11 o'clock. Uh, if, and by the way, I forgot to ask the most important sentence in the last two years. Can you all hear me? Uh, yes, of course, Ronnie, we can hear you. Okay, <laughs> Don't worry, I will stop you. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me just go straight into uh, what ARTC is. So ARTC stands for the Advanced Remanufacturing and Technology Center. We're a research institute as part of the ASTAR family, which is the Agency for Science, Technology and Research in Singapore. Uh, we are slightly different from a traditional research institute in the sense that we are a public-private partnership. We are, if, if, it's not the right word, but we're fully owned by ASTAR. Uh, and we report into them. Uh, but we do have a consortium model uh, in the sense that we have, uh, at the moment, 86 uh, industry uh, players who are part of our consortium in ARTC. And, and I, there's the mission up there, but what I really wanted to point out is that one of our mission is to upskill workforce to drive local industry competitiveness. And that's the area that we're going to deal with today. Um, there, are, uh, there are some of our, our main principal re rationale for existing, and that is there that you see on this slide, but I don't want to take up too much time. So just a bit of achievement. As I said, now it's, it's 88, it keeps changing. Uh, so we have 88 industry members, and in fact, they do participate in our governance as well through a program board. Um, we have seven core technology themes. Uh, we have more than 300 uh, core staff. And we have a set of industry flagship programs um, started with the model factory at ARTC, which was primarily aimed at industry 4.0 uh, technologies. Um, we have in additive manufacturing, 3D printing as it's more commonly known. Um, we have a joint lab with Rolls-Royce and Sazel um, in the aerospace sector. Uh, Ross, we also have a lot of courses, and I'll show that in a second, um, in, in robot operating systems, an open source system. And the, the Asia Pacific chapter resides in ARTC. Um, and we have a hyper personalization line, which the model factory was discrete manufacturing. And the hyper personalization line is uh, fast moving consumer goods, meaning it's continuous processes. And uh, you can see there, you know, those of us who are from my generation, you can see from my beard a long time ago, 555 used to be a famous 
uh, a, a famous brand a long time ago. But anyway, that's the, we've done more than that in, uh, in industrial projects that we delivered. So these are the seven uh, technology, excuse me, technology groups that we have. Uh, as you can see, it, it encompasses from, from what I'd call more industry for virtual um, manufacturing and digital manufacturing, as well as additive manufacturing, product verification, uh, data-driven surface enhancement being a technology primarily for the aerospace and somewhat for the automotive industry. And that's how we started. This is our 10th year, actually, as well as advanced robotics. So specifically to this area of upskilling workforce, um, our portfolio is in four categories. So there's a group of courses in digitalization, some in advanced manufacturing processes, uh, robotics, um, as I said, Ross sits in, in ARTC. And for today's webinar, the area is in the, the area of electrification and others. Uh, and the webinar that you're attending today is, is a, it's under what we call a masterclass in advanced manufacturing. Um, and just to segue before I end, end this uh, brief thing, because the presentation is truly by, by our, my associates with with two Rhineland and Scorpio, it just this came in yesterday's paper, and I think it just sets the stage for where we are going, where we, meaning in Singapore, are going with electric vehicles. Um, I haven't put in the entire article, but if you can go and look at it, it's on page A8, as I put there in the Straits Times of yesterday. Uh, the electric vehicle uh, population, small, obviously, but it has more than doubled uh, in a year, and you can see the graph on the right. Uh, you can see one that it's more than doubled actually uh, from, from close to 1400 to slightly in excess of 3700. Um, and the, the number of charging points and, and you know that they are, uh, the, there's a concerted effort to increase that. So the, the traction of, <laughs> traction, maybe not the right word, uh, but, but the adoption of electric vehicles and it's becoming uh, more prevalent in Singapore is, is something that is going to occur at, at a fairly decent clip uh, over the next couple of decades. So with that uh, segue, I would uh, stop sharing and I would uh, invite uh, Ian McDonald, who's the, the manager for training and courses at TUV Rhineland, um, to take over. Ian, over to you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good day to you, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name's Ian McDonald, and uh, I'm consultant training manager and technical manager uh, for and working on behalf of to Rhineland, as I've been introduced. So uh, thank you kindly for that. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on board this webinar. The, the first slide, uh, which my colleague Johnny is, is kindly sharing on my behalf, um, says it all really, electric and hybrid vehicle safety training, why? This is, um, this is the, uh, sort of the core of my little presentation today. Um, PPE is great, uh, PPE is, is fantastic, but ultimately um, should be our last line of defense. And uh, before that, we need to start using things like knowledge, experience, and of course, training. So PPE, uh, I stress, is the last line of defense. Uh, John, if you could uh, move to the next slide, please. Okay. This gives you a little insight into the uh, Tuv Rhineland uh, portfolio. And um, all of those little boxes that you see uh, emanating from the, 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 the car, the motor vehicle in the center, tells you everything that Tuv Rhineland are about and, and are involved in on a daily basis. Uh, the one highlighted green, of course, is, is sort of uh, my area of expertise, which is sort of the academy stroke training side. Um, but all of the other little satellite um, titles there um, tell you quickly the kind of resource and expertise at your fingertips um, when you choose to have Rhineland as, uh, as a partner in, in, in whatever uh, level of activity you're involved in. But of course, for now, we're talking about automotive services and in particular, electric and hybrid vehicles. So thank you, Johnny. This tells you a little bit about me. Um, 
even though I don't like talking about me very much, but anyway, there we go. Um, my Almost all of my working life, I've been involved in process and industry safety. And my wife will tell you that I nag everyone that I see uh, doing activities around the house or in the street or wherever it is, because my default position is always, are they doing this task safely? Um, could it, or could it be done more safely? So it's very difficult to shake that off, um, uh, even at the or even in the evenings and weekends, because that's my default position as a safe safety. So um, my little box in the left-hand corner there tells you a little bit more about me. Um, but basically, process industry safety is my forte. And in the last five to six years, I've been very heavily involved um, in electric and hybrid vehicle safety in particular. So hopefully, any questions that arise, I'll have to have a a fairly good, uh, fairly good answer back for you. But trust me, if I can't, I will find out and I will revert to you as soon as possible. Thank you, Johnny. Next slide, please. Okay. Electric and hybrid vehicle safety overview. Here are some interesting questions. Why does Tuvor Ironland need to offer electric vehicle EV and hybrid vehicle HV safety training? And here are the punchlines or the answers to that question. Um, quite simply, it's because high voltage DC, which is what we're talking about with battery voltages, um, can be potentially fatal. And there's a full stop there for good reason. And, and a little sign or a little logo image next to it, um, just to underline that point, OK? They can be potentially fatal. It's a fairly low voltage. Um, but of course, as with anything, the number of amps, uh, again, will, will, will be the potential killer. And uh, a, a small fact for you, anything above 70 volts DC has the potential to stop a human heart. Now, of course, um, when you think about 230 or 240 volts AC, you think that 70 volts DC is quite quite a small voltage, as I just said. But when you couple it with the amount with the amount of amps from a battery pack in a in a in a vehicle, that's the problem. And ultimately, uh, the third answer to that question is there will almost certainly be no second chances for any uh, casualty that becomes electrocuted while working on, on electric vehicle or hybrid vehicle. Okay, so if you get a shock, if you get electrocuted, you're probably going to hit the floor, and there's a good chance that you or one of your colleagues may not ever stand up again. And that's why we're all on this webinar today. So um, question two, who is at risk and what is at stake? Anyone that comes into direct contact with these vehicles is at risk. The consequences of electrocution, as I've already said, can be fatal or life changing. Question three, so how can we help our customers? And the, the, the simple and short answer to that is by providing the knowledge and the skills okay, through our training courses to keep everyone safe. And that's my job. And uh, that's what I do every day. And as I've said already, uh, in, a, in a fairly lighthearted, joking way, but this is my default position. Okay, So that's the way that we look at it on a day-to-day -day basis. So how can we help our customers then? quite simply by encouraging them to invest in safety in the following ways. Uh, they can, uh, by obtaining a reliable source of information, and that's available not only from the uh, original equipment manufacturers, the OEMs, the vehicle manufacturers, of course, but there are other, um, some are subscription-based services, some are free services of information. But in other words, to have information at their fingertips from whichever choice they find reliable and dependable by providing PPE to protect themselves, insulated tools, something that we offer as well, making sure that the vehicles are segregated in their workshops um, to, in other words, keep those that aren't trained or familiar or have the knowledge away from them. So in other words, a, a, forced, a forced division. And by alerting everyone by using uh, simple uh, warning signs, um, so just say, again, if you don't know, stay away. And the image on the left there, danger of death, says it all. And, I, and we're putting in red at the bottom of the sign there, sorry, the bottom of the slide there. But most importantly of all, how do we keep our customers safe? 
Uh, Johnny, next slide. By providing training. The training that we offer must include the following things or must, mu must cover these bases. Of course it must be informative. It must be up to date, but it must be enjoyable as well. It must reflect real world tasks and situations. The people that we're trying to train um, are hands-on people, are, are skilled people, but the classroom probably isn't their, isn't their best uh, environment. They're, they're best in the workshop with tools in their hands working on vehicles. And for that reason, um, we keep it relevant. We keep lots of uh, hands-on practical teaching and, and learning in, in all of the modules that we'll offer that we're going to come on to. And it also would include less obvious tasks. And, and we've added them on the slide there. For example, uh, vehicle cleaning. So for example, valeters and people who may charge the vehicles in whatever different situation and, and, and environment. Those are also crucial areas of, of, of knowledge and expertise for us to, uh, to pass on to, uh, on to others. As I put there at the, the end, um, must be delivered in a way that uh, the technicians can easily relate to. It's very important to make sure that uh, it, it's not just, if you like, death by PowerPoint. You know, it has to be, uh, has to be practical and uh, entertaining, if I can use that word, to hold people's attention, because if it isn't, um, at the end of the course, they'll look at each other thinking, well, what was that all about? Was it, was it good? Was it bad? So get them involved, uh, tools in their hand, um, and that's the way that we do it. So um, with, with that um, backdrop in mind, um, Johnny, can we, can we have the next slide, please? With that in mind, we've developed three training courses or three training levels, I should correctly say. And, and I've mentioned it a couple of times already that there's a very heavy uh, emphasis on blended learning. And by blended learning, of course, we mean face-to-face. Uh, -face. There can be remote online learning and a heavy emphasis on practical training. And ultimately, of course, there needs to be some, some testing um, because we want each candidate to end up with a, a, an accredited or recognized certificate. <clears throat> so uh, level one is described here. Level one is really uh, a basic safety awareness course. And as you can see, it's six hours of e-learning, uh, in other words, online, where a, a, a candidate's uh, profile is created on the Tour of Rhineland system. And then they're invited to log on and undertake um, the e-learning. The e and there's a little, uh, a little interactive knowledge check at the end of it. Uh, and which ultimately is to test. And if all is well, of course, they'll receive a certificate to say that they've undergone the, uh, the level one online training. And um, level one, as I just said, really is a basic safety awareness level to outline the risks and dangers. And just, just to get the, the, the candidates, I suppose, in the mindset, into the way of thinking uh, about these vehicles, to understand that they're not like our um, traditional internal combustion engine um, vehicles. They're totally different in terms of their, their power and drive, and therefore they offer different hazards. And it's worth, it's also worth mentioning, um, by the way, often people have a perception that these vehicles are more dangerous than a, an internal combustion engine vehicle. In some way, well, in some ways, but in different ways, yes, of course they are. But don't forget that we've been sitting on, um, on, on a small vehicle in the last 100 years that's been, uh, you know, via its internal combustion engine, having mini explosions thousands of times a minute under the bonnet. And of course, a fuel tank, a fuel cell carrying very flammable liquid. So you could actually argue that um, We've been sitting on a hundred years worth of, uh, of hazards and, uh, and, and problems already. This is just a different series of, uh, of, of hazards to become familiar with and to become knowledgeable about. So it's not better, it's not worse, it's just different and we need to learn a different way. Okay, I digress. 
Level two, so just go back a slide, please, Johnny. Level two. Level two is, of course, a step up the tree, step up the ladder, rather, and uh, can be offered in different ways. Uh, we can do virtual training. Uh, we can do face-to-face -face, or indeed blended learning. It's a two-day course. There's a recognized certificate via the Two of Rhineland per cert system and practical live training and ultimately a qualification at the end of it that is recognized and uh, certainly worth having. Okay. Level three, because of the uh, live working, um, must be undertaken face to face in terms of supervision. Again, it's a two day course and lots of practical live training involved. And as you'd expect, uh, also testing and ultimately uh, a qualification to be received. So uh, level one basic, level two, uh, much more detailed. Level three at this stage is top of the tree. Uh, level four will be, um, is coming along probably in the next six to nine months, um, just to give you a heads up. And level four will be, uh, will have heavy emphasis on diagnostics, on working on live circuits and so on. So uh, level four is, is being is worked on the background right now, but not uh, not available to the mainstream at this point. Thank you, Johnny. For those that are interested um, in these learning courses, in these training courses, this gives you a little snapshot, um, as we've called it, into the target markets. And as you can see, really anyone and everyone that's involved in the automotive industry probably should have an interest in these courses. Whether you are the, the center image with the arrow, um, an automotive technician is the obvious target. But if you look around the slide, you'll see that there are many other um, services and positions that would certainly benefit from having some of this knowledge. Even if it's only level one, um, the basic safety awareness course. And even if it, it, each of the candidates who did the course just picked up from it if if they don't know stay away that's enhancing their, their their safety knowledge and awareness incredibly just to understand uh, what the risks are and if they haven't had a higher level of training stay away and leave it to the experts to their colleagues um, that probably have had a higher level of training so be, as i say you can see from that uh, slide um, anyone and everyone who has an interest or who works anywhere near these vehicles would benefit from one of the three levels of courses that's on offer at the moment. Thank you, Johnny. We're now going to just talk briefly uh, about the different levels again, just to um, outline them and also indicate target groups. This tells you a little bit more about level one. And e-learning, as you might recall from the previous slide, with online modules. Target groups. Automotive technicians not directly involved with EHVs. Service department managers and supervisors. Senior managers within uh, organizations. Sales staff. And also including the less obvious um, uh, members of our team. Delivery drivers valeters and other support staff and perhaps we could also include in that um, recovery organizations vehicle recovery staff okay just as important that all of those people have a basic understanding as well level one being the basic safety awareness course and the outcome of the course is to raise the employee awareness of the high voltage systems and the associated risks and hazards and how to uh, quickly and easily mitigate those dangers and then we take you through the the, the, the structure of the vehicle and uh, basic safe working practices okay and if you don't know stay away and uh, as I already said there is a, a quick online assessment at the end which will result in the candidate receiving uh, a qualification next slide please Johnny level two uh, more focused and uh, more involved, as you would expect. And incidentally, um, the level two does does recap, does also cover um, most of 
uh, the level one training just to, in, in the first hour or two. So there's a little refresher at the start. And uh, target group is predominantly or almost entirely automotive or vehicle technicians because we're going to assume that they have the background knowledge. They've been working in a, a workshop environment for uh, months or possibly years. So we tend to just have a little recap on the level one and then straight through into the kind of tasks that they're going to be undertaking. And the, the expected outcome from this course is to develop the skills and knowledge required to work on the vehicles, of course. Um, and, but it's, it's important to stress that this will be in an isolated, in other words, um, the vehicle has been uh, removed of its high voltage by a senior technician um, to allow a level two technician then to go about their work. Um, and that's probably going to be uh, general servicing, maintenance, and, and some basic repairs. But the repairs will not involve the higher voltage system or high voltage components. That's for a higher level of technician. The course will uh, involve practical demonstrations by our, by our trainers, by our assessors, and uh, it will conclude with a written test and a final practical assessment undertaken by each candidate um, supervised, as you would expect, by our trainer uh, and or assessor. And um, if all goes well, which uh, fingers crossed it will do, because they've had excellent training, of course, um, they'll receive the uh, appropriate certificate. Okay, next slide, please, Johnny. Level three. Level three is only available as face-to-face -face training or learning. And this is for senior automotive technicians who have, um, by the way, already passed level two. You can't just skip from uh, level one to level three. You have to go through the levels, okay? Uh, culminating, of course, in level three face-to-face -face training. And this will give each candidate the uh, uh, skills and ability and the knowledge to work safely on live electric and hybrid vehicle systems. And will um, include removal of a high voltage component, for example, uh, the battery pack. And uh, return to a customer for road use. Okay. Will include practical demonstrations. And as you expect, with a high level uh, of examination or training level like this, a written test uh, resulting in a qualification. So every level has a qualification uh, to be obtained and uh, a worthy industry recognized qualification because two of Rhineland base all of their training around the German automotive standard DGUV 200-006. Now I haven't included um, any content from the standard in this presentation because I'll, I'll leave you to Google that yourselves. But it's a very comprehensive, well uh, respected and adopted standard. And um, being a German standard, um, you can understand or appreciate that it's very detailed and uh, has been accepted and adopted by, by organizations all over Europe as being a go to standard. Okay, Johnny, uh, next slide, please. I said right at the beginning, um, everyone, and you'll recall that um, PPE and safety equipment really is our last line of defense, and I stand by that. One of our partners, um, a company called Intac Limited uh, in the UK, we've partnered up with them because they offer a very comprehensive uh, safety solution to all of the problems faced by automotive technicians and without uh, going into too much detail on this slide there are uh, safety kits off the shelf um, that cover the minimum safety standards recommended uh, things like insulated gloves uh, test meters insulated matting to stand on and safety goggles and safety glasses in case of any battery uh, battery spills. The center image and the right hand image uh, indicates a range of insulated tools from um, from Intac. Now they can be large workshop based equipment uh, in for example a seven drawer cabinet that we can see there that will really cover every every tool that has an uh, uh, 
a standard uh, op, op, a standard uh, alternative will have an insulated equivalent is, is what I'm trying to say. Apologies, I couldn't quite get my words out then. And the small image on the right showing the uh, the tool set in the blue case, the blue, the blue storage and transportation case, uh, was actually specially prepared by, uh, by Eintac for a particular customer who only wanted quite a small selection of tools for the jobs to be undertaken on their particular range of vehicles. And it happened to be a, a large Japanese manufacturer whose name uh, we're not allowed to mention, but um, Eintac did all of their European uh, dealer uh, operations with these tool kits and also various PPE kits as well. So if you need any tools, need any PPE, um, Eintac can help you with those for sure. I'm very conscious of the time, so um, just moving on to the last slide is to say uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, uh, we're going to be uh, answering those at the end, I believe, rather than now. I wasn't aware of that at the time, hence my slide. But I uh, hope that's been entertaining for you. And I hope it's given you a little insight into uh, what Two of Rhineland can offer, what Eintac can offer. And uh, we're here, we're ready, we're waiting. And there's a vast amount of knowledge and experience from our, from our European operations uh, over the last five or six years. Um, just standing by to help, basically. So we're here when you need us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, and as, as Ian mentioned, um, maybe we didn't get it across, but there will be a Q&A session uh, in about 10, 15 minutes. So we can just hold your questions till then. And at the same time, there is one more presentation, uh, which uh, Dr. Mohamed Taureza from Scorpio will take. So uh, Reza, you can take it away now and share your screen. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Murali. OK, I hope you can see uh, my screen uh, with the Scorpio Electric logo in the middle. Uh, yes, yes, we can. That's good. Oh, excellent. Uh, so uh, of course, we don't wish to uh, contradict or even repeat uh, what Ian has been saying uh, from to Brandland. Uh, this time around in the masterclass, uh, we would like to appeal uh, to a different sort of audience. Uh, we would like to take a more high level view of safety, safety and from the perspective of uh, manufacturers and suppliers instead of uh, from technicians. So we want to make this as well-rounded as we can. Uh, my name is uh, Reza, uh, and I'm coming from Scorpio Electric. Uh, let me give you a bit of background on myself before I start. Uh, until about uh, two and a half years ago, I was actually in the payroll of ASTAR. Uh, I was being consultant to many different businesses, uh, from consumer electronics uh, to the later part was uh, aerospace with uh, uh, SI engineering, Singapore Airlines uh, engineering arms. Um, and, uh, and now I'm joining uh, Scorpio. I, I, and Two, two and a half years ago, I joined Scope Electric uh, as their uh, head of engineering and also acting uh, chief operating officer. Uh, but uh, so before we, I will, I will give an introduction uh, on the our session of the master's class. But before that, I want to introduce a little bit more about the company that uh, that I'm representing. We are called Scope Electric, and. Uh, we want to uh, first of all say a couple of things about our brand. So our brand has been, uh, has, we aim it to be a global brand uh, coming out of Singapore, uh, trying to make electric mobility solutions, uh, specializing currently in electric motorcycle manufacturing. Um, and the motto is we want to reach for the stars. So Scorpio is the name of a constellation. Uh, and, uh, and there are three things that we are fronting uh, in terms of products. Um, the first thing that we have to emphasize that we want to emphasize is on design. So the design will be the design of products uh, are going to be uh, one of the best, one of the most eye-catching, one of the uh, most uh, spectacular uh, design that you that you that you will see. Uh, so we want to take pride of that design uh, very much uh, in the first product and in subsequent product. Uh, the second one is performance. So we want for everything in everything we do, we want to be top of the class. Top of the tree uh, in terms of performance, in terms of uh, 
uh, uh, rider safety in terms of uh, uh, a technology also, right? So we know uh, with electric, with electrification rather, uh, mobility solutions are not just limited into uh, making things that move from uh, the world from uh, point A to point B, uh, but it's also becoming one of the let's say lifestyle package. Uh, we, you've seen you've seen that already with uh, with mobile phones and and it's uh, and and mobility solutions will be uh, cars and motorcycles uh, will be the next uh, will, will be your biggest uh, internet device that you'll have in your household, right? To digress a little bit more on, on, on the origin of the company, the company is actually called uh, Eurosport Technology, the one on the left. I don't know if you can see my, my, my uh, mouse cursor. Uh, it is, it is uh, majority owned uh, and seed funded, in fact, by a listed company in Singapore, Eurosports Global, uh, which also has other business units be besides Scorpio Electric. Uh, they have been the ex ex exclusive distributor and service provider of uh, Lamborghini and Alfa Romeos. Uh, and at, even at Scorpio Electric, we are also incubating uh, a new business uh, idea called EV Electric. Uh, more on that later. This is uh, basically what we have been uh, working together with uh, SMRT by and large. And, uh, and to share a bit more of the people behind uh, this company and this brand, uh, uh, Melvin Go and Joshua Go have been uh, have been all around uh, Southeast Asia and even Greater Asia, uh, uh, working on Lamborghini brands uh, and Alfa Romeo and Jeep in Indonesia, um, and they they've also co-invested in a couple of uh, companies uh, distributing those brands um, in Southeast Asia and East Asia, uh, and and they've gathered uh, basically team of uh, young team uh, of of you know, very capable with people. Uh, the first one is uh, Ju uh, Julian from KTM previously, and Function, our CTO, uh, was from Apple. Uh, and myself, uh, like I said, I've, I've, been, I've been basically consulting on manufacturing processes and systems uh, for the past 10 years uh, with ASA before I joined. So uh, after the company, I also want to introduce a bit more about the first product that we're going to launch. Uh, hopefully by end of this year, we'll, uh, we'll start to give, uh, we'll start to bring deliveries. Uh, again, like I said, total three in terms of specifications, uh, 105 kilometer per hour top speed, uh, 10 to 15 kilowatt hour, uh, kilowatt of uh, motor power. Uh, we're still doing some testing on it and a projected range of 200 kilometers. So this is one of the, uh, one of the top end, uh, motorcycle, uh, electric motorcycle that we're going to, uh, going to see in the near future. And, uh, and. Again, like I said, it's not just about moving people from A to B, it's also uh, a full suite of uh, technology solutions. So, and some of these are for convenience, uh, a lot of these actually for safety. Uh, I think it's very apt that, uh, that I, I point out that basically we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to be ahead of the curve, I guess, uh, in terms of, so if, if someone were to have uh, accidents on, on our bike, uh, the bike will sense that it has fallen uh, onto the road or everything, and then it will just dial uh, emergency services automatically. Um, if if subsystems and systems are uh, getting, for example, uh, into unhealthy state, uh, overheating, uh, will all will also uh, do uh, proactive uh, notification to users and also the service centers uh, and also to manufacturers so that they know. Uh, What's going on with the bikes, and if they if they have any, uh, let's say, corrective actions that need to be done, um, yeah. I'd like to go very quickly into giving you a bit of taste of uh, what to expect in the master class. So I don't know if uh, if the guys at ARTC have shared with you, but the, the master class, so far as I know, is going to be three half days, and two half days will be done at uh, sorry uh, by uh, to Friendland, and we'll take one half day. Um, and in that one half day, I hope uh, to cover uh, some of these, let's say, introductory content on uh, func uh, vehicle functional safety. Uh, you can you can see on, on the screen. And I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, what I've written. Uh, so at the vehicle level of vehicle functional safety, at the factory and, and workshop level, which is uh, called factory and after sales safety, and and also how more importantly as a manufacturer. And also by extension, our supply chains and our suppliers. Uh, how do we uh, 
ingrained safety in the automotive design process because safety is supposed to um, avoid accidents from happening. So, so safety cannot happen by accident, right? So it has to be designed from the get go um, as the product is being conceptualized and developed. Uh, and a couple of tools in there uh, that we like to share, uh, things like APQP, Advanced Product Quality Planning, how how to draw requirements for the product, and and and, and some of that requirement will be safety. Uh, when when things get designed, how do we even uh, make sure that it is good? So it's not just by testing. Again, like I said, safety comes from the design. How do you design such in, in such a way that uh, systematically you avoid all the risks of, 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 of the risks of hazards happening? Uh, and the last part is uh, PPAP, a production part approval process. Uh, this is a very common automotive uh, practice. So basically, we're, we're not going to make everything ourselves. We, we're still going to be able to buy, buy tires or even buy battery cells from, um, I don't know, BYD or LG uh, or Samsung. And, and how do we make sure that when we do, uh, when we do receive parts from these suppliers, uh, how, I, how are they going to prove that they've done their due diligence to check that that, that part or that module or that subject systems uh, have been thoroughly designed uh, and, and verified and tested um, before they ship it to us, before we put into our uh, product, right? Um, I want to give just a bit of snippet before we end, uh, maybe another one minute or so. Uh, uh, I want to share with you about this uh, uh, Swiss cheese model. I think I think I, I, I don't. Uh, none of us are Europeans. I don't think from the names that uh, the participants. So James Reason, which is a doctor of psychology, uh, a, a university of psychology, and uh, sorry, professor of psychology rather, uh, pardon my language, uh, from the University of uh, Manchester. So so he has actually devised this uh, theorem called okay, the Swiss cheese model. Right. So the, the the solid cheese represents the layers of protection that we need to do uh, that, we, that we need to have uh, incorporate as as all of us, right? Uh, manufacturers, suppliers, even workshop technician, even uh, even the workshop managers, and and the holes in the cheese represents the uh, uh, active failures, right? Um, and the objective is how do we minimize the possibility of committing active failures and latent condition of error? So, like I said, this, this is going to be one of the topic that I'm going to uh, share with you guys. I'm going to just share a little bit of things. Um, when I say active failures, what really means uh, one of these four things. Uh, slips, which is like, okay, something slipped my mind. I forgot to do that something, uh, unconsciously making a mistake. Uh, lapses, if I write uh, five steps procedure uh, and, and wearing PPE is one of them, I skip that one uh, uh, because I forget, uh, because the PPE is not clearly marked to me and so on. Um, it's also might lead to, to a risk, uh, mistakes. Um, if I say, if, if someone tell me, Okay, this battery uh, before servicing, you must you must drain the battery to empty so that there is no charge in the battery. Uh, but maybe the during the training, the one of the te the technician misinterpreted what does it mean by by discharging the battery. Maybe during the discharge, uh, they will actually get the accident. Right? Uh, we'll never know. And and violation. Uh, what if someone uh, consciously don't follow the rules? Like uh, uh, there's five steps. Someone would think. Uh, in the in the floor and the shop floor that okay, number four is not important. Can I just skip that? Uh, and and nine out of ten times it would been, it would have been fine. Uh, but then that there's always that uh, ten percent, even one percent uh, that actually can happen, right? Um, so so we know that uh, to make this to 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 make uh, a, a good system in a company or in the product, we have to get all these things uh, corrected, right? We we cannot cannot have ineffective training and supervision. Uh, we cannot have ineffective communication like your 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 trainers have to be uh well drilled uh, have to be uh how to say, have to be uh, tailored or, or versatile line, uh, versatile enough to talk to uh, people of different backgrounds from high education low education from different cultural background also uh, and violations like cutting cutting corners usually is happening if we have not enough staff uh, uh, and so on so basically uh these are just uh, like i said just a flavor uh first step into uh, in, into that muscle class that uh, uh, we're going to have uh, in about a month time. Yeah, uh, again, like I said, uh, I think to the end, I, I just wish uh, you all a very happy new year. I thank you for listening. I throw this back to Muralina. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Reza. Uh, and I, some of you can probably see me 
So the, the cheese was was a good way to end that presentation. Uh, anything to do with food, I'm quite happy to see it on the screen. Um, yeah, I want to start yeah. with something light. This is this, this is in the morning, uh, new in the year, so I want to start with something light. Yeah. Okay. So a uh, couple of things. Uh, I think uh, Reza brought that up, uh, and and I, I think that that was a failure on my part. Uh, just to show you uh, how the course is going to be run and and the, those. This, uh, procedural things. Let me just share the last bit of my screen. Uh, and let me just go Oops, here. Let me give me a second before we go into the question and answers. Uh, so these are the course dates, um, the 14th to 17th February. They are four half day courses, uh, uh, sessions, sorry. And It'll be from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. This is Singapore time. Uh, the first three days will be by TUV Rhineland, so 14, 15, and 16. Uh, and that will set the, the domain expertise sharing uh, on, the, on the subject of, of the risks uh, that are involved and, and based on the experience that they've had in Europe. And on the 17th, um, Reza's team and Reza himself from Scorpio will add that dimension of, of the practical uh, viewpoint from someone who's actually having to do that on the shop floor, as it were. And that'll be at 2 to 6 p.m. There are a couple of QR codes that will take you to the web page and QR. And I'll keep this on uh, during the Q&A so you can look at it. But let me just go to the, the other dimension of any course which is the cost. Uh, so this is it's the, the, the course fee um, before GST. And so all of you from Singapore will know that. Uh, so for international participants, meaning those that um, are not on the right side, the Singapore citizens, PRs, or uh, long-term visit plus holders, uh, the fee is with GST 1,712 and $513.60 if you, if you meet those criteria of Singapore citizens, SPRs, or uh, long-term visit pass plus holders. So I just wanted to get that uh, out of the way quickly. I was planning to do it at the end, but I think since Reza brought it up, and it is important that, that those who are attending this webinar and are thinking of this course, that they are aware of, of the procedures that will be there as part of this course. So the dates, they are four half days, two to six, and I will leave this on. Uh, and with that, can I request Tom, if you could uh, manage the q and I believe there are already about 10 questions in the, in the Q&A slide. So maybe you could, Tom could take it away. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Murali, um, for sharing on the course details. Uh, well, like Murali mentioned, we have about 10 questions, uh, but unfortunately, we have only about 10 minutes left in the webinar. So uh, I do apologize ahead of time if you are not able to answer all the questions. So let's let's pick a, a few questions, right? So we have some questions from anonymous uh, um, participants asking that if they have experience in EVs and understand the risk involved, would there be any benefits to still taking these particular workshops, you know, namely the level one, two, and three? Uh, I think Ian, you may have an answer for this. The training is, is crucial. Uh, if, if you're an existing automotive technician and you're going to be working on electric and hybrid vehicles, uh, please go through the training courses. Uh, level one won't be essential because you have that background knowledge already. Um, but please start at the minimum of level two um, and then progress to level three. It's crucial that you get the training. Yep. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Yin. Yep. Uh, another question from uh, Mr. Wei Chen asking if uh, would, where will the practical live session be conducted? Uh, I believe you're still working uh, these particular uh, details out. Um, so, once we have a, a, a live venue on for live training, we will share with all the participants, all right? Uh, we have a question from Thomas asking if the cost recognized worldwide by EV uh, manufacturers, the safety training. 
You can come in on that, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Two of Rhinelands have academies all around the world. I think there's about 20 global academies. And uh, we're, we're offering training. Uh, I mean, just, just to, to give a few locations, we've done training um, on electric and hybrid vehicles to candidates from Brazil, Spain, Germany. I think there's some coming up in Poland. And uh, OEMs definitely recognize the qualifications. In fact, um, the, the training in Poland will be from, for a large German uh, sports car company manufacturer. So, yes, they do recognize it. Um, we do call upon, um, as I mentioned already in my presentation, the, the German standard, the DGUV standard. Um, and most of the manufacturers, if not all of the manufacturers, will, will use or recognize that in some form. Hence, the Tour of Rhineland training has been based on that. So, yes, there will be recognition of that certification. Great, great. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, I have another question asking on uh, risk indicators. For risk assessments uh, in this training, uh, what are some of the risk indicators that you'll be covering? The, sorry, sorry, can you just repeat that question? The, the risk indicators, did you say? Yes, risk indicators. This is from anonymous uh, participants. They're asking um, what are the risk indicators that we're using for the, the risk assessments uh, they will be taught in the program. The, the indicators will be um, very, to be honest, the risk indicators are quite obvious in, in, in terms of um, the operational uh, procedures uh, required for, by the OEM. Um, but we'll be picking up on, on all of the common ones, for example, the isolation of the vehicle, the testing of the vehicle to check for um, presence of voltage. Um, in the vicinity of the high voltage components, in the cabling, the inverter area, under the bonnet, um, all of the areas that you would need to, uh, to, to check for voltage um, prior to undertaking any work. The, 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 the risk indicators, the risk analysis, if you like, the risk assessment, um, we can help with that. The OEM almost certainly will have some, uh, will have some input um, if you want to seek their guidance as well. Uh, in, in fact, our default position always is or always will be, if in doubt, consult with the OEM. Um, but if you need our help, um, we certainly can. We do have access to, to um, information pools or resources that can help with that. But um, to be honest, it doesn't matter who the manufacturer is. In many respects, it doesn't matter what the vehicle type is, um, whether it's a motorcycle or a, uh, a car or a bus or a heavy goods vehicle. The components will be largely similar, albeit in different locations, and therefore the risks and hazards, and therefore the risk assessment that you would go through uh, will be broadly similar across any of those vehicles, to be honest. Oh, thank you so much. Well, while we are on the topic of risk, um, are there any risk safety standards that are followed in the, in the programs? Yes. Um, DGUV 200006 does outline uh, things like suggested PPE and does uh, outline um, isolation procedures, um, but ultimately, as I just mentioned, it will come down to the, to the OEM to, um, to outline those. Uh, we cover them in basic, um, in, in basic uh, understanding and basic procedures. Um, yeah, yeah, essentially that's it really is, as I've said already, if in doubt, consult with the OEM, um, but any help or advice we can give in addition to that will be forthcoming. Okay, um, Mr. Tuareza, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, uh, just, just to, uh, how to say, echo what Ian has been saying. So uh, let's not, let's not uh, draw lines between uh, let's say to run and which is a certification body and, and a training, uh, let's say institute uh, with the OEM. So uh, think of it that, um, in such a way that the, the trainings that's typically given by a third party like to for uh, uh is, is more like it's more like a platform training. It's meant uh, to be universally ad uh, adopted. Uh, and then if you ever, for example, uh, work with OEM such as ourselves, uh, 
uh, then that training is just going to be more contextualized to the product. It's more going to be like uh, contextualized to the to the tools and facilities available in the company and in, in the workshop in the factory. Um, but it should not be one or the other. It should be uh, put two together, right? So so you need Absolutely. a platform. Uh, a, you need a platform. A, training just like uh, how you go to school, universities and so on. And then when you go to the, the real companies, you have to go through on the job training, uh, system training, organizational training, uh, uh, building safety. So this is more like contextualized. And this is what, uh, uh, if you were to go to the OEM, we probably have uh, manuals for servicing and so on, but this is contextualized to our product. Uh, and I think to have a more uh, holistic uh, view of what's going on uh, in the world in all the OEMs uh, put together. Uh, uh, Ian surely uh, is able to uh, uh, advise us on, on, on all that. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think we can have a one final question. Uh, Mr. Wei Chen is asking if the PES cert, uh, whether it's a lifetime certification. No is the short answer. Um, the duration, I can never remember if it's two years or three years. I, th I think it's two years, um, after which time you don't need to go through the full course, but you can literally just sit the final examinations again, um, unless you haven't been directly involved with working on the vehicles or, or in that scenario. And in that case, we might take a view then at that point that it might be worth undertaking the course again. But if you've done the training and you've done the uh, you've uh, achieved the qualification two or three years ago, and you've been working uh, using that skills and knowledge over that time, then just simply setting the final sitting the final examination and practical assessments will be sufficient to uh, then get the next level or the next uh, certification that will last you two or three years again. So yes, it it it, it does need to be renewed. It does need to be reevaluated by to Rhineland. And, and the reason for that, of course, is to ensure consistency um, in the training that each of the candidates um, maintains that level of skill required um, and also upholds the integrity of Tour of Rhineland and, and its training courses. So, you know, that's a, also a very important factor for, uh, for the candidate and for, for Tour of Rhineland. Thanks again, Ian. All right, uh, with that, I think we've come to uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, I guess we run out of time. I've also launched a short poll. Uh, I highly encourage participants to actually reply to the poll to find your interest on the program. And of course, uh, with that, I would like to thank our speakers, uh, Mr. Ian McDonald, Mr. Mohan Toraza, and uh, Murali for actually hosting this program. And